Amen. 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 Good morning. So I was, um, I was in a, a meeting this week, one of only about 14,000 meetings that I had on my calendar this week. And it was here at the church. Um, I was running a little bit behind. I think this was Tuesday or Wednesday, and it was in the Dunham Conference Room here as a pastor meeting. So I grabbed my stuff out of my office, and I'm running into, I'm running into this meeting. And I sit down and put my stuff out and get my pen, get my paper, and we start this discussion. And as we're, as we're talking, I, I hear, I, I look up, and in the, the conference room we're in, there are these speakers. So, you know, you can, if you have a video or something, it plays through the sound system. But I was surprised because as I sat down, I looked up, I heard these birds that were, were tweeting, these birds that were, were chirping, and it was coming through the speakers. I'd never heard that before. That's fine. So we just continue to meet in five minutes, in 10 minutes, in 15 minutes. And it was like in my mind, it was, it was like the telltale heart. They just kept chirping louder. They just, it wouldn't, and, and I, I couldn't stop hearing it. Now listen, I have no problem with birds. I love birds. Their feet, a little creepy. Their eyes will steal your soul. But I mean, for the most part, <laughs> birds are fine. But I don't know whose idea was to play these birds while we're having this meeting. And, and about 20 minutes in, I just can't because no one seems to be noticing the birds. So I raise my hands in the meeting and I say, hey, I've just got to like, can I point out the elephant in the room? And everyone looks at me and I point it up. And they all looked up. I said, the, the birds. Like, why are the birds chirping? And everyone looked at me with the blankest stare in the world, and Susan, bless her, looked up, looked at me, and the sweetest voice said, Mark, there's no birds chirping. And Rob Renfro looked at me, and in a very pastoral, caring way, he just said, what you drinking in your coffee? What you got in the <laughs> cup of coffee right there? I thought, what? I knew this was going to happen at some point. I guess birds are not the worst thing to just hear in your head. But I looked down. Now, here's the rest of the story. I, uh, I have hearing aids. Um, I've had hearing aids now for about two years. Hearing aids, are, they're pretty cool. Um, they have Bluetooth capability. So if you were to call me on my iPhone, it would go straight into my head. And I picked up my phone, which was face down. I picked up my phone. I turned it around. I don't know if you're familiar with the Calm app. <laughs> I had, unbeknownst to me, triggered the Calm app, the background of this app, when you turn it on, there's this flowing river, and there are birds that are tweeting in my head. This was not in the system. I was the only person that was hearing the birds. Now, I could have told them, oh, it's just this. I thought it would be more fun just to let that hang. So I went on with the meeting. So that's our secret between you and me. Side note, Matthew McConaughey can read a bedtime story. It puts me out in 35 seconds every night. So there's that. Now, as I'm thinking about the new creation, which is what I'm talking about today, it's just so funny how God works. Because I just, I look, everything that I'm preaching on, I just look over the course of the week and I always pray this prayer, Lord, interrupt me. Let this come to life to me. And I kind of laughed a little bit about that meeting because I wonder, is there a greater melody of heaven? Is there a greater song of creation that's being sung over us but we're missing it? Are we running the risk in our lives of just participating in casual Christianity, but there's a greater song? We just said we're praying for an awakening, but are we giving God 60 minutes on a Sunday morning to awaken our hearts? What if there's more? So here's where the Lord really took me, and here's where I want to take you today. God told me this weekend, he said, Mark, you need to go to church, and I didn't quite understand that. I'm like, well, Lord, of course I'm going to church. I'm preaching on Sunday. I have to go to church. But God just kept saying, no, 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 I need you to go to church. And I'm, I'm here this morning, and I'm sitting in the midst of these songs, and I'm looking at your faces, and I'm sensing what God is doing, and I get 100% what God is saying. I want to talk about new creation this morning. As we wrap up, long story short, we're kind of approaching this time, six movements, the Bible in six simple movements. We started with creation, we moved into the fall, we talked about Israel, we talked about Jesus, we talked about the church last week, and today, new creation. What started in a garden is gonna end in a garden, but the question I wanna propose to us today is, 
Maybe the one garden that we think, maybe we're skipping a garden that we're called to cultivate right here. But before we get to new creation, I just, I wanna stop and pause and just focus on this word new. Because in Revelation 21, which is where I'm gonna end, right, God says, see, I'm, I'm making all things new. And, and that took me back to a moment in the book of Isaiah. If you have your Bibles, will you start here with me? Let's, let's just go to Isaiah chapter 43. Because you can't really embrace the new creation if you don't settle on the word new. If you don't, if you don't miss the fact that God is still a God. God has always been a God of new. And I love this moment in the book of Isaiah chapter 43. Context is always key, right? So Isaiah was a, Isaiah was a prophet. Prophets, prophets had a tough call, man. I'm telling you, the role of a prophet was to speak the words on behalf of God, to talk to God's people who were choosing sin. Sin, by definition, is missing the mark. It's going against the good and perfect life that God has called us to live. That's sin. And little by little, over the Old Testament, of course, you see, I mean, there was Exodus, they were delivered, and they chose to go back into bondage just in a different way. So here, they're in Babylonian captivity in Isaiah. And Isaiah is speaking to them, and yes, the prophets would speak all of this truth, and it was hard to hear, but listen, look for the hope. Look for the grace, look for the mercy that you find these prophets say, and, and hear the the Israelites, they're, they're in captivity. There's a wilderness in front of them. Jerusalem is five to 700 miles away. They're looking for a deliverer. I mean, they had Moses. Who's gonna lead them out? Are they always gonna be in this place? In Isaiah 43, verse 16, we get these words. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and the horses and the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Isaiah says, remember, remember the time, that time that you were here before, and how God gave you a deliverer, how God marched you out of captivity. Remember that moment that you walk to the edge of the waters and you're standing in front of a sea and the crushing weight of captivity, Pharaoh and his army was pressing down on you and you thought it was done. God told Moses to raise his staff and the waters parted and you walked through the water on dry ground and on the other side of that, you remember when you looked back around and at the snap of the creator's fingers, the waters closed, your captors gone. You remember, look back, remember all of those moments that God delivered you, that God brought you through. Look back, you see this word, remember. God instructs his people over and over, remember, remember, Passover. God says, write it on your calendar every year. You go back and you remember how I am for you and not against you. Remember, remember, remember. But then what do you do with this, verse 18? Forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I call that Bible whiplash. What do you do? When you're reading along, you're like, oh, that's good. And then you're like, whoa, what do I do with that? Be still and know that I am God. But run the race with perseverance set out before you. Are you still? Do you run? Do you remember what God has done or do you forget the former things? What, what's happening? What I love that God is doing here is he's causing, he's calling his people to focus on the right things. I don't like to brag, but typically if someone says I don't like to brag, you know they're about to brag, right? I don't like to brag, but one of the few gifts that I have is backing up my vehicle. I, it drives my wife crazy. I love to back into the garage Right, it's kind of compact, it's a small space. I drive a Prius, it's not like it's a Ford F-150, but I love backing up. I'm that guy in Market Street that you honk at that you don't like, because I'm gonna pull in front and I'm gonna back into a spot because God's given me the gift, why would I squelch that? 
So when you're driving, in fact, one of these days, I'm not saying I'm going to do it, but I feel like I could drive home from church backwards on Lake Woodlands and do a great job. In fact, some of you, you may drive better backwards than you do forwards, but that's beside the point. You have that rear view mirror, right? I mean, that's the purpose of the rear view. You use that rear view mirror. That's what you use to look behind. It guides you. It reminds you that there's something there and you need to back up. Listen, here's what God is saying. Right now, your main focus, people, is you're looking at what's behind. You're looking for something I have already done. And what you're not doing in your life is you're not looking through the windshield. You're focused on one tiny piece, but there is something greater. In fact, God says, Forget the former things, don't dwell in the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not, what are those two words? Perceive it. It's not behind me, is it? Yeah, it is. You just didn't say it. That's on you, not our screen guy. Do you not perceive it? And let me tell you, that's something we need to write down. That's something that we need to underline. And that's a question that really should get us a little scared, and here's why I say that. Is it possible that right now in our lives, we are so focused on what was, we're so focused on the past, that God is birthing a new thing, and we just don't see it. We're not looking through the windshield. We're not looking for God to move in new ways. There's a a quote that I love this week. I don't know who said it, but this is the quote. Hope, hope is like a window pane. If our focus is not clear, we may only see the reflection of what's behind. Isn't that good? Hope. Let's say a new thing is like a window pane. If our focus isn't clear, if we're not looking through the glass at what's in front, we might get stuck in a reflection, something that's behind. This is what God is saying to his people in Isaiah. He's saying to them, listen, there is a deliverer that is coming. There is someone who is going to lead you and God's people in a way that's going to blow your socks off. Get ready. Don't miss it. And Jesus comes into the world. Jesus comes into the world and the new creation interfaces with our planet. He steps in. He's here. In fact, what I love is the way that Joshua McNall, I love the way that he wrote this. He said this. When the Bible speaks of new creation, it usually speaks of something that has already been inaugurated. The startling message of the New Testament is that new creation broke into this old world on the day when Jesus sat up in a borrowed tomb, wiped the sleep of death from his eyes, and walked confidently into the morning sun. God's new creation started with the incarnation and it culminated with the resurrection New creation began when the lungs of Jesus took their first breath inside that damp and darkened tomb. And don't miss this. And new creation continues with us, with me, with you. It continues when we take our first breath of God's transforming spirit. But there's one more step to come. New creation also awaits a future fulfillment. It is already, but it is not yet finished. Perhaps this is why in John chapter 20, I, I love, I love this moment on the other side of the resurrection. I know a couple weeks ago I talked about the Emmaus Road and Jesus just shows up with these, with these disciples and, and they didn't know who he was. There's this other moment that, that Jesus shows up and, and it's the morning, it's Easter morning and the women have gone to the tomb and Mary sees the tomb is empty, has an encounter with an angel and she runs out and there's Jesus. She sees Jesus but she doesn't recognize him and John, the disciple, writes it this way, he says, but Mary thought that Jesus was, does anyone know? Say it loud, hearing aids, yes, a gardener, yes. Coincidence? I have to think that John's just going, okay, that's good. Because in the first garden in Genesis one and two, right? And then Genesis three, humanity, everything's broken. We are out of the garden of Eden because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for every single one of us. Jesus steps out of the tomb on that day, new creation. We are back in the garden. 
here's the tragedy. The tragedy then, I mean, we're quirky people, Christians. We can be so focused on what's behind, we can allow the past to define us. The enemy can remind us of who we were. But what, is, what does Paul say? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. That when we breathe this breath, when we take Jesus Christ in, then all of a sudden, the old is gone. The new has come. Jesus invites us into a deep relationship with him. And here's the other side of it. It also can become easy when we see all of the brokenness of the world. When we look at all of the brokenness, all of the chaos, and let me tell you, choose your chaos, people. There's chaos everywhere, right? And you can almost just go into Christian default mode. You know what that is? That's where we just sit here, we get into a corner, and we suck our thumbs, and we just go, it's going to be so much better when we're in heaven. And that's where we stay. All of a sudden, we're in this creation now, where we're called to be the catalyst through Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, is the same one at work in us. He's calling us to be people of the harvest, but we want to step back, bent write a lot about everything that's wrong with the world, but not be the very agents of change that he's called us to be. And that's heavy on me. That's heavy on my heart. I think about Jesus said, look, the harvest is plentiful. You look around in the world, where do you start? The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest to raise up workers to go out into his harvest field. We are called to join the gardener to line up our lives with Jesus, to both to be so deep in our relationship with him that we go about addressing the weeds. Yes, looking at the thorns. Yes, and it's hard and it's difficult. I was pruning my rose bushes this week. I'm, I'm not great at this stuff. I always have to call my dad. My dad's the gardener. My dad's the one with the green thumb. And I'm like, dad, is it time? And dad's like, yeah, it's probably time. So I go and I get my shears. And I go to get my garden gloves. I can't find them. I don't know where they are. They're probably buried under last year's rose bushes because I never put them up where they were supposed to be. But I'm a smart man. Okay, I know I can't just take these thorny rose bush things that I'm pruning back and just grab them with my bare hands and shove them into a bag. So I take one of my dog's biodegradable poop bags and I'm like, I'll just use this. Um, I might as well have used toilet paper. It didn't work very well. I'm taking all of these thorny branches. I'm shoving them into a hefty bag. It's sticking. It was a hot mess. And I know my neighbors laughed at me. I know it. I heard her. That's fine. It's hard, right? When you're going about the business of pruning, when you're going about the business of tending the garden, again, it goes back to black and white. Are we losing the color of the world? Are we stopping and taking time to see the fruit, seeing the good things that God is doing? That's where we're called to be as well, church. Don't get overwhelmed with the whole. So many times I get overwhelmed. It's just my heart. It's just my heart. I just go, God, I want to fix these things. God, I, I want to know, like, how do I fix all of this? And I just feel God again go, aren't you precious? Look at you being me. Look at that. But you're not God. I am. I just need you to go about the work of bringing peace into the world right now. You know who Jesus defined as children of God? He said, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called children of God. In the midst of bringing the new creation here, we have to work at not just waiting to get to heaven for it all to get better. We've got to work as long as there's breath in our lungs to bring heaven here. We pray it every Sunday. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the encouragement that I find, the passage of scripture that I go back to over and over again, rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness, let your gentleness be evident to all for the Lord is near. And don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, through prayer, petition, thanksgiving, Present your request to God and the what? The peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts 
and your minds in Christ Jesus. And here's looking at the color in the world. Here's focusing on the beauty in the world. Here's what Paul says is absolutely essential when you're going about the business of restoring creation through the power of Christ at work within us. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, admirable, anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of what? Peace will be with you. Do you see it over and over? Peace, peace, peace. Listen, anytime you're overwhelmed in the garden by all the thorns, by all the rocks, what I'm trying to do a better job is I'm trying to focus on what are the things that are lovely in my life? What are the things that are trustworthy in my life? What are the pure things? What are the noble things? I'm telling you, it's a change of perspective. It's almost as if there it is, that peace that I've been looking for. It just begins to wash over me. We have a role, and it's to be the very agents of change that the world needs to bring the kingdom, to be amidst of the garden here, and to go about bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. Here's the other side, and this is important as well. We know how the story ends, don't we? We know how it ends. And we also know hope. And with that hope should come incredible joy. This is why Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. You've got 66 books in the Bible, 66 books. And I know there's a lot of things in here we get. There are some things in here we don't get. But the last eight paragraphs in the book of Revelation is a picture of heaven. And let me tell you, it is glorious, it is beautiful, and it is full of color, and it is clear to understand. That's a picture that we have. It's a promise that we have. It's something that, it's funny, I I remember a conversation I had with my mom before she passed away. She had stage four small cell lung cancer. And I was with her in the hospital room. And and I tell you, some of you, when you come to me and you're like, "Do, do you just know how hard it is when you pray and you pray and you pray for healing and you just get no as an answer? Some of you are like, do you get that? I'm like, yeah, I get that. Because I remember just interceding for my mother, interceding and praying for healing, praying for a cure. But listen, healing comes in ways that we don't always understand. And I remember my mom, I'm trying to hold it together. I mean, goodness, I'm in the church. I should like be all smiles and rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice, but it's hard. Jesus experienced hard times. I love that my mom took my hand. This was such a gift to me, and I'm never going to forget it. She took my hand, and she said, baby, it's okay, because I know where I'm going, and it's going to be pretty great. This one quote, this world and its history, their prelude and foretaste. All the sunrises and sunsets, symphonies and rock concerts, feasts and friendships, they're but whispers. They're a prologue to the grander story and an even better place. Only there it will never end. J.I. Packer said, hearts on earth say, in a joyful experience, I don't ever want this to end. But it invariably does. But the hearts in heaven say, I want this to go on forever. And it will. There can be no better news than this. So what's the rest of the story? Here's our hope in the now, but the not yet. Revelation 21, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, 
God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. No need to write a funeral homily. I'm so excited about that. There will be no mourning. There will be no weeping or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. It's as if John is saying, God said, I'm taking the rear view mirror, popping that off and casting that aside because there's no more looking back anymore. Verse five, he who was seated on the throne said, does this sound familiar? I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and they're true. He said, it's done. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. So brother and sisters in Christ, may you be encouraged. May you know that God is in the business of making things new, that in Jesus Christ, we are a new creation, that we hold the hope of eternity in our hearts, that as long as there is breath in our lungs, may we cultivate this garden. May we be passionate about the way that we live, the way that we love, the way that we care about the marginalized and the oppressed, the outcast and the poor. May we be gentle in the way that we deal with one another. May we focus on what is lovely, what is trustworthy, what is pure. And may we, until the last breath in our lungs, be a people that reflect the love of Christ. And God's people said, amen. Amen, amen, and amen. Until we hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. I know the church is in a scary place right now, but I want to tell you something. I have all the hope in the world because I know this. God is on the throne. Let's not be agents of chaos. Let's be agents of peace. Will you join me? I just... um. I need to spend some time on my knees. We all do. Let's just bow your heads for a moment. What's your past? What's your fear? What's that weight that's been on your shoulders? Where's the hurt? Where's the addictions? Where's the lies? I just want you just for a moment, just picture Jesus in front of you. Just picture it. With his arms out. Nail scarred hands saying, as far as this, the east is from the west, I want you to know how high, how deep, how wide, how long is my love for you, my child, my creation, my beloved. Father, we come before you, God, and I just want to lift up the hearts of your people. I want to lift up those, Lord, that are carrying weight in their life right now. So easy in this world to buy into the noise, the chaos, the distraction, to see everything that's wrong, to just focus on every rock, to focus on every thorn, to know that the enemy is just worming in so many different ways, but yet you say, peace, be still. Yet you remind us that you're in the boat with us. The one who says to the wind and the waves, be still, is the one who calms the storms in our life. Lord, we need a new thing. Father, we need an awakening. Lord, we don't want to settle. We want more. We know you're a God of immeasurably more. So, Father, I lay it all at your feet. God, I lay it there. And I trust that you are. You say, I am Gracious and loving God, continue to breathe peace. Father, we know the end of the story, but we also know that you're in the midst of our story right now, so continue writing on our pages. Father, may we dust the feet off of our feet. 
step away from those things that are killing us and walk towards life and life everlasting. It's a big prayer, but you're a bigger God. So Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. And it's in your name that we say, amen.